Welcome to the Covenant Podcast. The Covenant Podcast exists to equip listeners with theological content from a 1689 Baptist perspective. We're on the Man of God Network, brought to you by Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary. And in this conversation, we're excited to talk about someone who uh, did not subscribe to the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith, but someone that we greatly appreciate, and that is Gerhardus Voss. Uh, we are excited, especially because we have our brother, Danny Olinger, uh, to talk about Gerhardus Voss. But uh, before we jump right into talking about Voss and his life and things that uh, we can glean from his ministry, uh, welcome to the podcast, Brother Danny. Thank you. Glad to be here. And uh, yeah, we're so appreciative that you have taken the time to join our show, and we just want to ask you if you would kick off our conversation by uh, introducing yourself to our audience, uh, whatever you want to tell us, whether that's your conversion to Christ, your vocation, what you're doing in service to the Lord, and uh, particularly your interest in Gerhardus Voss, because as I did not mention in my introduction yet, you have written a book uh, on Gerhardus Voss that has been excellent. I've been enjoying it as I've read it, called Gerhardus Voss, Reformed Biblical uh, Theologian, Confessional Presbyterian. So thank you for your work on this book. Would you introduce yourself to our audience? Sure. I serve as the uh, General Secretary of the Committee on Christian Education for the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. I did not grow up in the OPC. I grew up in East Central Ohio and uh, in a divorced home and uh, was uh, blessed to receive a scholarship offer to Cedarville College in Western Ohio to play sports. Uh, Cedarville at the time in the 1980s was a general association, a regular Baptist church school. And they just asked me, do you believe in Christ? And I said, sure, I believe in Christ. And, uh, you know, was not, didn't belong to any church, but uh, my sister did belong to a non-denominational Bible church. And I accepted the uh, scholarship and went there and heard the gospel and really was rejoicing in the good news, um, but had a question immediately. Uh, Cedarville at the time was a school in which you had to get a minor in Bible, and that meant that you had to also uh, basically be indoctrinated in dispensationalism. And my question was, is, is this what the church has always believed? Because uh, here I was just a new convert. And so I started to read about the Protestant Reformation, you know, started to read St. Augustine. And, and uh, you know, the answers uh, were like, well, this is somewhat new in the 19th century. And so that led me to uh, seeking out other Reformed individuals on the campus, and they were wonderful. And uh, really started to get excited about reading about the Reformed faith. And it happened that Cedarville at the time, there were a lot of Reformed people still there because it had been a Reformed school up until 1953. Um, it had been a, a Reformed a Presbyterian Church General Assembly, and it had only been sold to Dr. James Jeremiah in 1953. And so uh, I was so very thankful for, you know, what Cedarville, the, the, the wonderful faculty and uh, what I was learning, but at the same time, I had this passion for the Reformed faith, and there were professors who were actually assigning Cornelius Van Til to read, and Jay Gresson Machen, and John Murray, and I was reading uh, these individuals and thinking, wow, this is where I want to be, uh, but yet it was the pre-internet days, and uh, uh, to find an OPC church in Ohio at the time, there were only two of them, um, and uh, so it was not until I had graduated and, and went on to seminary that uh, I, I got more connected with the OPC and ended up uh, becoming an ordained minister uh, in the OPC. And then uh, had the privilege uh, for the last 20 years to uh, serve as the General Secretary of Christian Education. Well, Danny, it is an absolute joy to have you on today's show. I personally have been immensely blessed by your work with Reformed Forum and your expertise on Gerhardus Voss, which is the primary subject of today's conversation. And maybe for some of our listeners who 
aren't familiar with Voss, would you be willing to give us a biographical sketch uh, of Voss, who he was, um, why he should be studied, and, and just kind of whet our appetite for where we're going to be going with the rest of today's conversation? Sure, love to. So I started out at Cedarville uh, reading Fantil in Machen and Murray, and then the more I read them, they kept on mentioning this theologian, Gerhardus Voss. Uh, Cornelius Fantil, uh, Voss was his theological hero, uh, called him the most erudite man he had ever met. Uh, Fantil and Voss were so close that Fantil preached uh, Voss's funeral sermon. John Murray also uh, looked at Voss uh, as, uh, some, as his mentor. He called Gerhardus Voss the greatest uh, exegete, English-speaking exegete in the 20th century, which is quite uh, a, a praise for Voss. Uh, Machen uh, taught with Voss uh, for 23 years, but he first had Voss as a student, and Machen said that uh, if he knew half as much as Dr. Voss did, he'd be writing twice as much. Um, and so, uh, and this doesn't even get then to the three friendships that Voss had that were the even Trump, those three friendships, uh, in that his best friend at Princeton for 30 years was Benjamin Warfield. Uh, they were inseparable. They walked every day. Their families were close. Uh, they were theologically agreed. They never voted against each other on the faculty meetings. Uh, they were totally agreed on scripture and the reformed faith and uh, were just, uh, just a wonderful uh, friendship. Uh, that was here at, in the United States, but back in the Netherlands, uh, Voss's closest friend was uh, Herman Bovic. Uh, their fathers had grown up uh, together in the same place. Uh, Herman and Gerhardus's had been leaders in the Christian Reformed Church in the Netherlands, and the two were really close. When Voss had a major decision to make, it was Bovic that he was writing to, and they were exchanging notes all through the 1880s and 1890s, and we're about as close as you could get uh, in regard to um, the friendship, so much so that there was even uh, thought uh, up until the 1920s that they were related. <laughs> now, that's not the case, but that's how close they were and how close their families were. And then on top of this, um, there is the figure of Abraham Kuyper. So Kuyper comes into play in that Kuyper kept on trying to recruit Gerhardus Voss to teach at the Free University of Amsterdam. And Gerhardus Voss kept on turning him down. But Voss, for his part, wanted to help Kuyper to get exposed to an American audience. So Voss took the lead in the 1890s in translating Kuyper's works and also was the, the catalyst of Kuyper coming to the United States in 1898 for the famous uh, Stone Lectures at Princeton. Um, and so on Calvinism. So Voss was the one who, who basically got that all the in motion and rolling. And he was the primary translator uh, for to put those uh, lectures into English. It was it was really something, you know, uh, Kuiper was going to lecture in English and to take all those Dutch manuscripts. They had a trans tr uh, translation team. But, you know, Voss was basically working around the clock to get them in shape and and so again, uh, how how it started to strike me uh, the more I read Voss in that regard and his friends, who has a set of friends like this, and that doesn't even get to the fact that he was also uh, close friends with President Woodrow Wilson, <laughs> who attended the same Presbyterian church that he did and was a ruling elder in that church. Voss didn't agree with his policies, actually didn't agree much with his theology. But they were really nice, tight friends. I mean, the type that you would have over for dinner or, or go over um, at this, the, uh, the other person's house. As a matter of fact, when Foss's oldest son was born, the two families that immediately gave gifts uh, to the Foss family, one was uh, uh, B.B. and Annie Warfield. The other was uh, Woodrow and the first Mrs. Wilson gave gifts. Who has friends like this? No one has friends like Gerhardus Voss. 
Wow. Yeah. That's, that's tremendous to think about. Um, and wow. Uh, in the beginning of the book, you begin to tell uh, about some of the early theological education of Gerhardus Voss and uh, some of the things he studied and where he studied and where he went when he studied and how Kuiper tried to recruit him to various places. Uh, so in your inclusion of the biographical sketch, would you mind to trace that out a little bit about um, his theological development in, in, as a student and then as a professor in his youth? Sure. Um, so to tell the story of Voss, you really have to go back and understand the Netherlands in the 19th century. So when uh, at the turn of the century, of uh, the 19th century, uh, the king decided to broaden the religion uh, of the, the Dutch Reformed Church. And there were believers who reacted violently against this because they were right that these were political measures that were taken and it harmed the fidelity, the confessional fidelity of the Dutch Reformed Church. So that had happened in 1816. In 1834, uh, there was the secession in the Netherlands uh, in which a group of believers uh, then stood up against this, seceded from the Dutch Reformed Church, which was a state church. And uh, Foss's uh, father and mother were involved in the group that ended up leaving. And what we have trouble comprehending is that was great sacrifice to identify yourself with the uh, secession. Um, you could be imprisoned. Uh, you could be fined. Uh, you would have you would have soldiers living in your home uh, to keep watch over you. Uh, so, but the fact was that that they believed that this what had happened with. Just the uh, uh, the crass liberalizing of the church along the lines of the Enlightenment, uh, the 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 equivalent of what was happening in Germany with uh, Schleiermacher. See, where where Voss grew up, uh, his parents grew up was on the border. It was on the border between Germany and the Netherlands, and so uh, uh, and it was it was uh, a very fluid situation where. Um, the, the, you would go back and forth across the border. So this group of believers taking this stand was persecuted. And that persecution lasted until uh, 1848 when there was finally granted religious uh, liberty um, in the Netherlands and really across Europe. And from that then, a theological school was finally put together by those who had been a part of secession, and that was Compen. And it was created in 1854. And Gerhardus Voss's father was a part of the first class. Herman Bobbick's father had been uh, uh, also basically a part of things, but he was a little bit uh, older and uh, and he uh, was engaged, but he wasn't part of that class. But uh, he was definitely a part of the, of the environment there at Compton. And so I, I put that all to, all before you because that's uh, uh, what Gerhardus Foss is being raised in. He's being raised uh, in a home in which the parents are willing to die for the Reformed faith, willing to suffer for the Reformed faith. A home where being taught the Bible and being catechized uh, with the three forms of unity was basically, you know, at the heart of their family life. So this is a young man then who from the very beginning had this incredible training. His dad was arguably the leading Christian reform pastor of the 19th century in the Netherlands. That's how prominent his dad was between, say, uh, 1858 and 1881. Um and, and then again, he's very close friends with the Bobbing family. And if it wasn't, you know, Jan Voss that was the leading guy, then it was Jan Bobbing that was probably the leading pastor in the 19th century in the Netherlands. So he has this training and it and, and his parents recognize that this is he's gifted. And they also are committed to education. So they actually send him to language schools 
when he's a teenager. And so he starts to uh, be taught, even though they are they are living in poverty, it's so, things are so poverty stricken in the Netherlands at the time that the, the immigration to America, sometimes you would have whole churches leave. And that's because uh, people just didn't have food to eat. And here in America, there was food to eat and they could worship. Uh, and, and so they would just come and hold whole, whole groups. Um, so, so it was a tremendous sacrifice, but his parents wanted him to get the best education. And so he excelled at that. And then when he was 15, they sent him to Amsterdam. Um, and there his uncle, uh, Hendrikus Buker, who would be his mother's brother, who was the, the the CRC pastor in Amsterdam and uh, the biggest CRC church in the country. And his his uncle was very faithful and, and, and a great pastor. And so there, Voss uh, is in the gymnasium and he's with the best of the best. And again, he's the top of his class. And so he's graduating and everyone recognizes this is a prodigy. He's just exceptional in everything he does. But he's also very humble, very, very quiet. He's also very frail. And he would he would have health problems his entire life. But what happened in 1881 was that his dad suddenly took a call to Grand Rapids to be a pastor of a very big CRC church here in America, Christian Reformed Church in America. Gerhardus Foss comes with his dad and enrolls then at the newly created uh, Bible school, Grand Rapids, which, which we now know as Calvin College. So he goes there. The school's only five years old. And it's evident immediately that um, he's smarter than the professor. He's more learned than anyone there. And they realize they have a problem. Uh, so they immediately uh, make him a, an instructor uh, after his first semester. And uh, so he's teaching classes and they decide that it's a six year program and they decide that they're just going to graduate him in the second year. And he graduates in, in, in this basically his second year is, is teaching and just reading books that he needs to read to make sure he's, he's filling in the gaps. Um, he then uh, wants to get the best training in the world. And the best training in the world for the Reformed faith at the time was at Princeton. And so he asked Princeton, it's unheard of what he does. He basically says, can I be accepted as a middler? I've already taught at a seminary level. Uh, I have uh, you know, proficiency in language. And by this time he knew seven languages. Um, uh, which is, you know, think of it, he's 21 years old and he knows seven languages and not just knows them. I mean, he's expert. Um, they grant him that. And in his, uh, 21 months at Princeton, he just uh, wows them. They really have rarely seen a student like him. His senior thesis is so brilliant in a takedown of the Graf Wellhausen critical documentary hypothesis that that William Green has has it published and writes the intro and it's just it's amazing and the reformed world knows it's amazing and they know that there's this kid at Princeton that that's just he's the he is uh stunning word gets over to Abraham Kuyper so uh Foss graduates in 1885 from Princeton he takes the scholarship that he received for winning uh, his thesis, and he goes to Berlin. He because Berlin was the place to go at the time for if you want to have the you know the best critical thinking. He wanted uh, to meet the enemy head on, to learn from the best, and he goes over there. And Kuiper um, uh, realizes that Foss is over back in Europe, so Kuiper. A uh, new boss because Kuiper's son Herman was uh, classmates with Gerhardus at the gymnasium in the late 1870s in Amsterdam. And so uh, he already had a connection. Uh, his son Herman would end up becoming 
for decades the church history professor at the Free University. Uh, and so uh, Kuiper does the astonishing thing of offering Voss um, a position on the faculty at the Free University at 24 years old, even before he had finished you know, any, any his graduate work. Voss declines. He would have loved to have done it, but his parents very much wanted him to come back to America and to teach. So I've given a lot of historical details, but maybe the thing here is that why why is uh, uh, William Green, why is Abraham Kuyper, why are these other Princeton professors making such a big deal about Voss? Well, here's what he's doing. He he has a view of scripture that is so orthodox. So based upon the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter one, that is immediately recognizable. But at the same time, he's understanding the progressive nature of Revelation, how Genesis connects to, to Revelation, how the Old Covenant and New Covenant connect, how promise and fulfillment go together. And he is understanding, you know, in a way that is, is enriching uh, the Bible along the lines of what the discipline known as biblical theology. Now, Gehertus Foss never liked that name. You know, he he believed that that name was, uh, you know, created under an evil star, <laughs> you know, going back uh, to the 18th century and, and Gabler and others when it was created. He would have liked much better the name, the history of special revelation, but the ship had already sailed on what people were doing in regard to biblical theology in the name. So, but he basically was making the case that, um, so originally liberal biblical theology was over against uh, systematic theology. Voss was making the case that the two do, are not opposed to one another, but they go together. One is more logical, systematic theology is more logical. The other is more historical. And that's biblical theology. One draws a circle, the other draws a line, but they they go together, and they're not to be separated. And and so here he is uh, saying that you actually need a robust, inerrant biblical view of Scripture to have a robust, legitimate biblical theology. And so he was a taking on the critics at the very point that they thought was their strength. And, and he was really dismantling them. He kept on pointing out that they were begging the question. They were putting their conclusions into their formulations rather than letting the scripture speak for themselves. And that was, and that was just so for, for, the, for Bible-believing Presbyterians, for Bible-believing Christians, Protestants, this was the guy everyone was looking for. You know, to put the liberals on their heels and to show that this enterprise that they were up to was basically not only illegitimate, but bankrupt. And the thing is, now that we're 100 and, you know, 40 years later, from that 1880s or so, or 30 years, um, he's been proven right. I mean, no one, no one adheres to uh, you know the, these critical theories. They still have the same philosophical underpinnings uh, from Kant and the Enlightenment. But Graf Wellhausen, I mean, the documentary hypothesis is mothballs, you know. And, and so, in that sense, you know, uh, he was so helpful. And this is what catches the attention of Kuiper. This is what catches the attention later of Cornelius Van Til. This is what catches the attention later of Machen in regard to the apologetical aspect of defending the faith over against criticism. But again, he is so quiet, so humble, so reserved that he will not tout himself. He will not promote himself. He's like this hidden guy that all these giants, when you read them, they'll 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 make these incredible statements about him, um, but but he's he's basically just doing his work, in, in you know faithfully but quietly, and and so that that is what's happening in in the 1880s and into the 1890s, and then obviously when I mentioned Van Tillen, 
in Machen into the, the, the 20th century. Hmm. Thank you for that, brother. That was excellent. And I'm glad that I asked you that question about uh, Voss's education, although it wasn't prepared uh, there. And uh, in just a moment, I promise we'll get to the scheduled uh, questions that I sent you beforehand. But uh, you did mention that Voss was uh, excellent in his understanding of the languages. And so just for our audience who uh, hasn't read your book, I was wondering if you could tell them what Voss studied for his doctoral studies. Yes, uh, he wrote a, <laughs> he wrote a, a dissertation on a 13th century Islamic war. So it's a, it's a it's textual criticism um, that is taking place. Uh, uh, so uh, in regard to to the, that Islamic um, Arabic uh, dialect, it's it's probably the most obscure. Uh, thesis you could ever write who who's really qualified to even understand if he's getting it right or not but that's uh, it's uh, there's a copy of it in Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia uh, but it, it again it, it's uh, he is his so he, he when he was a teenager and he went off to the language school that's when he became pro proficient in French he grew up on the border between Germany and the Netherlands so he had Dutch and in, in in uh, German as his native languages. At the same time he was learning French, uh, he learned Latin. He then picked up uh, the, the Hebrew and Greek immediately. And uh, again, this not this is not just picking them up. This is like expert level that he uh, had the command of the language. Uh, he had a wonderful ear, and he uh, his whole life loved poetry. And uh, so the language, I, you know, I find that ministers who are musical tend to really pick up Hebrew and Greek. They can hear the uh, the verb endings and other things. And uh, he just had that. Uh, and uh, so very gifted with the languages. Hmm. Thank you once again. And as promised now, back to our scheduled questions. Um, in the book and in our conversation already, you've mentioned many of the people that were friends with uh, Voss during his lifetime. And so I won't ask you again who were some of his friends. You've done an excellent job of pointing out who some of them were. Um, but you do mention in your book that he had several correspondence with his friends uh, through letters. And so I'm interested to uh, know what your thoughts are about how these letters help us to better understand Voss as he writes to some of his friends during his lifetime. Yeah. Um, he, um, in the 19th century, particularly, he was always writing to Warfield and to Bavink uh, and to Kuiper because he needed theological advice. And I mean, these are three great guys in the 19th century, in the 19th century to turn to. And you can see how he's trying to, to, to glean from them certain decisions, uh, sometimes theological, other times it would be personal. And uh, he was trying to work through these things. And uh, the Presbyterian Church uh, was um, uh, starting to experience uh, change. And one of the ways was that through uh, uh, Briggs, uh, Charles Augustus Briggs and others, we're trying to broaden the church, broaden the theology of the church. And Foss uh, found himself, uh, you know, uh, being one who was not in the press train church at the time, being very alarmed. So he was also writing these men about these things and what to do because he did not want the Presbyterian church to go down the line that Briggs was advocating because it would be a lessening of the Calvinism of the Presbyterian church. And so uh, Foss uh, was very aware of that, and he, he was prophetic. And that's why in 1903, uh, he, 1901 to 1903, he might have been the most prominent theologian fighting against the confessional revision in the Presbyterian Church to the Westminster Standards, where the Calvinism of the, the document was lessened, uh, because he believed uh, that um, uh that there was an Almeridian trend in the church, was, which was going to do great harm. And so, for instance, the, the way that Foss uh, explained 
uh, he wrote a uh, he gave it an address on the scriptural doctrine of the love of God, and um, so many were arguing in the Presbyterian Church at the time that God God is love. Well, of course God is love, but Voss was pointing out that if you make God's attributes love alone and not holiness and justice also, that you lose these other attributes. And here's what Voss is arguing: you also lose love itself. And and so and so going down this line, um, he was really explaining that Calvinism is interconnected. That your doctrine of man and your doctrine of God and your doctrine of Christ and your doctrine of the church all go together. And if you are attacking one, you're attacking the system of doctrine. And so uh, in that sense, um, you know, particularly at the start of the 1890s, he could see the handwriting on the wall, and he was definitely talking a lot to Bovink and Kuiper about what to do. Now, once he moves to Princeton in 1894, his letters with Warfield stop because he's with him every day. You don't need to write letters when you're talking to the man every single day. Uh, they walked twice a day. They walked at noon and they walked in the evening and uh, there was a rhythm. And since B.B. Uh, Warfield's wife, Annie, was an invalid, his schedule was very precise. Boss was a very precise man also. So these two, you know, again, uh, unless it's, there's a thunderstorm out, you know, they're together. And uh, so they're talking continuously. Well, Danny, this has already been a wonderful conversation on the life of Voss. And um, I want us to now transition into uh, maybe what Voss is most known for, at least uh, in, in the Reformed and particular Baptist realms. And that's his, his axiom that eschatology precedes soteriology. Uh, we know Voss as the, the father of biblical theology, even though um, he, he may not like that term. Uh, but in the Reformed world, um, Voss is in a class of his own when it comes to tracing out the progressive and organic character of God's special revelation throughout history. So would you be willing to maybe talk a little bit about how Voss arrived at these conclusions? You've already mentioned um, Voss just had such a proficiency with the biblical languages. He had an incredible knowledge of uh, how scripture fit together as a whole. How did he, how did he get to the point where he's able to connect some of these dots that others just weren't able to in his day and, and really arguably uh, most of church history as well? Yeah, great question. Um, well, he believed, when he says, he talks about eschatology, he doesn't believe that that's a doctrine that's just reserved for the last days, but that eschatology pervades uh, uh, all the scripture. Now, uh, what uh, what he really saw and what he I think he really believed was that the Westminster divines had gotten it right. Um, that they had understood the nature of the Bible being covenantal. And so the Westminster Divines talked about the covenant of life or the covenant of works, that God entered into man at creation. And Voss understood uh, that Reformed theology had always understood that uh, to uh, have an eschatological goal, that if Adam had sustained the probation, he would have been given life, and that life would have been with God in an environment in which there had been no more sin, no more possibility of sin, but God would be all in all, and, and there would be this mutual uh, fellowship between God and man. This was the hope put before uh, Adam. Um, and so uh, that is, uh, uh, according to, Foss writes a great article on the Doctrine of the Covenant and Reformed Theology, in which he basically explains where others go wrong. Now, what's, what's fascinating to me about this article is he doesn't talk about St. Augustine, but he's really echoing Augustine in, lo in a lot of what he's doing. Uh, but he's pointing out that um, Roman Catholicism doesn't have a doctrine of, of the covenant of life from Genesis 2, 16 and 17, because Roman Catholicism does not see man as created upright at the beginning. Roman Catholicism sees man as created uh, deficient, as finite, as flawed, so that it takes a supernatural gift of God, a donum superaditum, to make uh, a man whole. And that's what's lost in the fall. 
But Voss points out, if you have that conception prior to the fall, then it's no surprise after the fall that s salvation becomes the work of God and man. It's synergistic uh, because man's not tr totally ruined by the fall. He points out that uh, the Pelagian conception uh, of doesn't have a covenant of works because Pelagianism sees man as uh, created uh, upright and there's this ability. Doesn't need the Pelagian doesn't need any help from God to get there. Uh, the Pelagian is just going to recognize, you know, that uh, that that God's going to recognize man's good works and it's going to to reward him. Um, same thing, you know, we go down the route with the semi-Pelagian, much much like Roman Catholicism, only without a a donum super adidum. So so Foss is saying, look, the Reformed faith is the one that gets it right here, that man was created upright, uh, and God. When God created man, he entered into this covenantal relation. But what happens is, is that man sins. The covenantal relationship is uh, broken. And according to Genesis 2, 16 and 17, in that original covenant, uh, the penalty of this is death. It's 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 a damnation. It's uh, the wrath and curse of God. Uh, but the, the wonder of the gospel is Genesis 3, 15, uh, that God... Uh, through the seed of the woman promises redemption uh, that will crush the serpent's head. Uh, and uh, that is the, the the promise that we have before us. So that the Westminster Divines then recognize that as the covenant of grace. So that Jesus Christ is the one who fulfills the covenant of grace. And so you have this structuring then to the Bible uh, that, that the Westminster Divines recognize. And Foss recognizes that this has eschatology throughout. In other words, the goal of the covenant of grace is that we might commune uh, with our God uh, in an environment in which there's no more sin and no more death. God will be all in all. And then as Revelation 21 and 22 puts it, you know, the new heavens, the new earth. And that's what Jesus Christ, the second Adam has brought about. So the place where boss really nails it down is he goes to 1 Corinthians 15, 45 and following. And he exegetes what the Apostle Paul is saying there. And he shows that the Apostle Paul has this in view in regard uh, to what's going on with Adam in the garden. That this is what's put before Adam in the garden. And what Jesus Christ has done has brought the realization. And that's, you know, he's life-giving spirit. This also means that in regard to eschatology in more concrete terms than in thinking in terms of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven being an already not yet reality. In other words, you do not have to wait till the final day for the kingdom to be a, a present possession. It is here now. Uh, it is uh, ours now through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, we are, are uh, in first Thessalonians one, uh, 10 terms. We're just awaiting for the return of our, uh, of our savior in the consummation of all things. But but we have kingdom life now, even as we look forward to that kingdom life in full. So we have eschatological life now, even as we look forward to that eschatological life uh, in full. We have resurrection life now, you know, in uh, John 11, 25, 26 cents, I, uh, you know, when he's talking to Martha, Jesus talking to Martha, you know, I'm the resurrection and the life now even as we look forward to it in the full. So, so when Foss exegetes like that, uh, it's just, it just, it, it just opens up the whole Bible. And this is what men like Murray and Van Til or Edmund Clowney or Richard Gaffin in more modern times uh, saw just as much as Herman Bovic and B.B. Warfield saw uh, earlier times. B.B. Warfield said uh, that Foss was uh, probably the best exegete that Princeton ever had, which is really a stunning statement. But that, again, gets to the fact that they're recognizing that once, you know, you read this exegesis, you're sitting there going, yes, you know, this is what the text is saying. And so um, in that sense, you know, Voss, this very obscure, quiet theologian, has sort of won the day uh, in regard to, being the guy that's putting forth eschatology precedes soteriology. I, I don't think there's much debate today in Reformed faith 
about that. I think we're all agreed on that. We might have differences on the nuances, but I think in the structure, we're all operating on, on the same uh, level. Hmm. That's very helpful, bro, as you have uh, talked to us about Voss's uh, impact and articulation on uh, biblical theology and eschatology. So we want to encourage you to read those sections of this book. And if you can, pick up a copy of Gerhardus Voss and read his biblical theology for yourself. Uh, but uh, at the end of your episode there, brother, or excuse me, at the end of your answer there, brother, you uh, started talking about uh, some of the people that were influenced by Voss, and you talked particularly about his exegesis. But I'll give you a fuller opportunity now to talk about other ways that uh, people were influenced by Voss. You've mentioned Van Til. Uh, I believe you mentioned Gaffin at one point. So what were some ways that we can observe their Vossian influence? Yeah, so so Cornelius Van Til, um, again, totally indebted to Gerhardus Voss. A lot of people don't realize Cornelius Van Til was very amillennial. He, he was, he's not a post-mill. He's an on-mill. And yet he, he is... Uh, he also is uh, uh, very much understanding antithesis, obviously, when you say Fantel. But that's what Voss was saying over against the liberals. And this is what Machen and Fantel both picked up on from Voss, is that there's no middle ground between liberalism and the Reformed faith. Uh, there's no liberal... Uh, it, they uh, Liberalism had, had put an alien hermeneutic on the Bible. They were not allowing God to be God. Uh, they were not allowing his word to speak, uh, and it was bankrupting the church. See, Foss, Foss writes this book in 1926 uh, called The Self-Disclosure of Jesus. Um, he uh, couldn't get a publisher, uh, and uh, Machen helped him to find a publisher to, to get it um, uh, out there. And Because uh, Machen believed that it was the supplement to Christianity and liberalism, which Machen had published three years earlier. And in the book, Foss doesn't say this, but this is this is my read of it. He's basically uh, saying, okay, if you want to go down this critical line in which Jesus is just a good man, he's not the uh, God come in the flesh, he's not virgin born, if he's only a good man who uh, didn't realize what was happening, you know, that was Albert Schweitzer's view, and and, you know, uh, this was all a shock to him and things like that. He, they, in other words, if he didn't have a messianic consciousness, if you want to toe that line, um, and if you just want to basically, you know, the corollary of this is that the Christian faith becomes just a moral uplift in what we uh, look to ourselves as we're following after Jesus, this one who's the example of going before us. Voss is arguing, if you want to get down this line, you're going to lose the church because there's going to come a point in time where people will stop giving themselves to a myth. They'll stop giving their lives to a myth. They'll stop. Why do you need to go hear the preaching of the word? Why do you need to tithe? Why do you need to pray? Why do you need to do all these things? If Christianity is just mythical and it's all about coming from self and within. And he was utterly right in that. And see, Machen and Van Til understood that. Um, and what the difference is that when the Presbyterian conflict is happening, Foss is coming to the end of his life. And so uh, Van Til is 30 years uh, younger than, than Voss. Machen is 20 years younger than Voss. And so they're more at the heart of it. And um, so they're the ones that are carrying that, that forward and uh, uh, so that's for them. For Richard Gaffin, so Gaffin is really the one who resurrected Foss in our lifetime. Um, Gaffin's um, parents were uh, founding missionaries in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. They had been with Machen. They were utterly devoted to Machen. Um, and then so Gaffin is raised uh, in the OPC. And he uh, is exceptionally gifted, just like Foss was. Uh, and uh, But he starts to glean what 
Foss is saying. And he did this, basically, he was um, studying under John Murray. And Murray had wanted Foss to study uh, Calvin's view of the Sabbath. And he said, you know, you might want to read Foss on this. And when Gaffin read Voss, light bulbs started to go off uh, in regard to eschatology, uh, in regard to what the 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 uh, uh, you know the fourth commandment, and in regard to our hope, and in regard to the whole system of doctrine. So Gaffin then goes off to Germany, uh, prize student at Westminster, goes off to Germany, studying with the, the best of the critics. And he comes back to teach at Westminster Seminary. And he basically uh, adds another figure to Foss. By this time, um, in the Reformed world, in the 1960s, 1950s particularly, 1960s, Herman Ritterboss has come to the scene. Ritterboss is Fossian. Um, he's basically the next great Dutch theologian who's following in the train of Gerhardus Foss. And Gaffin, who uh, uh, is fluent in Dutch, is reading Ritter Voss in, in, the, in the Dutch, and he's reading Voss, and it's starting to all come together for Gaffin. So he then uh, writes his, his dis dissertation, Resurrection and Redemption, which is basically an expansion upon Voss's exegesis of 1 Corinthians 15 and what it means uh, in regard to... Uh, 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 Jesus Christ, uh, what his resurrection means in regard to the kingdom of God and what it means to the individual believer and also what it means to the Ordo Salutis. And so Gaffin then starts a, a half century of work that builds upon this um, and also then goes into other areas. He he takes this and he starts to explain um, uh, in regard to uh, perspectives on Pentecost what this means in regard to Acts 2, what this then means in regard to, to upholding a cessationist position of, of Scripture, which is in, in line with the, the standards. Gaffin then also runs with this in regard to what it means then that the kingdom is an already not yet possession uh, in that uh, the cross, humiliation, suffering, is at the center of the kingdom now. And what that means uh, in regard to humiliation unto exaltation. And so Gaffin uh, becomes, I think, the theologian of our generation that that really uh, is building upon Voss in that that sense. Now, there are other theologians who who do great things with Voss. Uh, Meredith Klein, uh, his exegesis on uh, on the Old Testament is profound uh, in regard. And he's, and he's basically also... He confesses that everything he's doing is built upon Voss. So you held up the biblical theology earlier. Klein just basically says, you know, what Voss presents here uh, as the outer structure, I am digging into on, on the inner structure. And so there's others like Edmund Clowney, a, a incredible theologian in his own right that we could turn to. Uh, but again, I think, you know, you have to start uh, with, with Van Til and, and Gaffin as the two giants, but then, you know, again, the others are amazing. And, and it's not even getting to men like R.B. Kuyper, uh, Nebby Stonehouse, um, you know, uh, two men that immediately come to mind and they're indebted to Voss uh, in working uh, from him. It's very helpful. And um, I hope it goes without saying for our listeners that we do have a great appreciation for our Presbyterian brethren. We've had several Presbyterian scholars and pastors on the Covenant podcast over the years, and we've always been blessed by those discussions, just as we're being blessed right now by uh, having Danny on today's show. But Danny, as you know, um, our audience is primarily comprised of confessionally Reformed Baptist or Calvinistic evangelical Christians. I, I do think we do have some Presbyterians that listen from time to time, but the bulk of our audience are um, Baptists in nature or evangelical in nature. So with that in mind, um, if you had to sell non-Presbyterian Christians on why they should read Voss, what would be your best sales pitch? <laughs> well, to me, the, the, the Baptist theologian that um, 
I think of when I think of Voss is someone who writes so much better than Voss. You know, Voss is, uh, his his sentences um, are not always the greatest. Uh, again, English was probably, you know, at the beginning, like his eighth best language. Uh, so that it, even though he ended up living here for decades, you, he, when he went to bed at night, he was still dreaming in Dutch and German. You know, that's uh, really, you know, the, the he still had his whole life. He still had to convert it in his mind when he wrote an English sentence. Uh, so he, his sentences are awkward and that's why it's so helpful to read Charles Spurgeon because Spurgeon and Foss are doing many of the same things. They uh, are viewing the Bible covenantally and, and Spurgeon is also recognizing the covenant of life and the covenant of grace the way Foss did. So if, let's say, for instance, when I come to the Psalms, Voss wrote a great article on the eschatology of the Psalter. It's profound. Uh, but it takes a lot of reading to say, okay, what, what's he saying here? And, and it's nuanced and stuff. You could pick up uh, the Treasury of David uh, by Spurgeon, and you can say, oh, yeah, that's what Voss is saying. It's, it's just done so much clearer here. Um, so there's that, that engagement, the going back and forth, because both of them, see Jesus Christ as the center of the Bible. So there's a Christ-centeredness to what's going on in their exegesis. And I think that that's, uh, a, a uh, for all of us uh, in the Protestant world who are heirs of the Reformation, in which we affirm uh, the Scripture, Sola Scriptura, uh, and we affirm at the center of the Scripture is Jesus Christ, and then we affirm the doctrines of grace. And I believe, for instance, that if you read Voss and Spurgeon, just say on the Psalms, you're going to see that great over overlap. But again, one is so much clearer. The other is a little bit of a learned language. Now, that's what's always scared people off about Gerhardus Voss. He's a learned language. Uh, he is difficult at times. Um, and um, I recognize that. But at the same time, that's why theologians love him. You know, he was not bringing stuff down. He wanted us to aspire up to truly, you know, and he was just being straightforward. And, and in, in that, I think it's a noble goal. Uh, uh, so uh, part of what I've tried to do is try to make him more accessible without uh, dumbing him down, per se, hopefully. Uh, for those who are interested, who've never read Foss before, the place to start is with his sermons, Grace and Glory, because Grace and Glory are very, very, for lack of a better word, practical. And I say lack of a better word because for Gerhardus Foss, the most practical thing that can take place is the cultivation of communion between us and the living God. So he's not going that when he's not going to give you application the way that you norm you know or might hear application. He's going to give you true application in that the more you are seeking to live for the glory and enjoyment of God and cultivating that communion, the more you're going to live for the glory of God in your daily walk. Mm -hmm. And so the sermons are going to be uh hitting that home in a way that that's really profound. And there's a wonderful introduction to, to those sermons by Sinclair Ferguson, another theologian who totally, uh, uh, you know, uh, credits Foss as being foundational to his theology. Uh, and so uh, I would recommend, you know, seeking out grace and glory. Yeah. And if I can just give a quick plug on the end of that, um, go to Reform Forum and listen to Voss Group. I think for like eight years, uh, Dr. Camden Busey and Dr. Lane Tipton and of course, Danny uh, joining as well, have been working through Voss's biblical theology as well as uh, select sermons from that uh, from that volume you just uh, referenced from Voss as well. His sermons, um, such a such a wonderful treatment of Voss. And for me, somebody who's trying to get better acquainted to Voss over the years. Uh, they've been, they've proven immensely valuable for me as well. So uh, just want to encourage listeners to go check out those resources at reformed forum. Hmm. Amen. Well, this has been a delightful conversation. We have in almost an hour covered uh, some, some things about Gerhardus Voss that I hope will be helpful to our listeners. And uh, to kind of cap this conversation off now, 
uh, brother Danny. We appreciate you joining us. Do you have any final thoughts or encouragements related to your hardest Voss or uh, anything you've written about him in your book or anything you want to say now at this point as we come to an end? Yeah, well, so again, so very kind for you to, to allow me to have this opportunity uh, to engage with you. Um, I think Voss would probably be horrified to know that we were talking about him like this or I'm talking about him like this because he'd want us to be reading the Bible and he would want us to be those who are owning uh, the confession. So owning the 1689, owning the, the Westminster Confession, uh, you know, living out of it, uh, that um, there's a consistency to the Reformed faith in the Bible. It's not to say uh, that uh, uh, we are sinless, and it's not to say that uh, uh, councils and synods, uh, it's not denying that councils and synods do err, but this is the most consistent form of Christianity. And, uh, and in that sense, it's blessed. Uh, but, but part of that is an understanding that you know, we've been saved by grace. We were no better than others. The Lord loved us when we did not love him. But what should then be at the center of that kingdom life that we now have in Christ is humility and a cross nature, laying down our life for our God, laying down our life for others, exalting them as Christ has exalted us. That's what he would want us to do. I think he would want us to live that life uh, for the glory of God um, and to seek to to promote others, you know, not to promote ourselves, not to make Christianity about our own kingdoms, but rather to give ourselves away. And I think he would, he doesn't say this, but this is how I read him, particularly in the sermons. When you give yourself away like that, uh, the Lord blesses it. You're blessed. Uh, you actually gain back, uh, you know, the Lord uh, is, is with you in ways that are, are better than, than any, any earthly treasure. So that's why I think, that would be my final thought on Foss. Amen. Danny, thank you so much for coming onto the Covenant podcast today, brother. We want to wish you all the best in your continued scholarship and your service to Christ's church. And we trust that our time together today will be a blessing for all who take the time to listen. Thank you. And to our listeners, as always, we want to thank you for your continued support of the Covenant podcast. Until next time, we wish you grace and peace. God bless. Thank you.